Hi, my name's Catherine Pugh. I'm an environmental scientist at the City of Launceston. Last week we published a video on some myths around the Tamar River estuary. We had some really great questions and some great comments on that. And we'd like to thank everybody for those comments and questions. And we thought we'd take a bit of time to answer some of them today. So one of the first questions that we had was around the name of the place. People had raised that it had a different name or that they didn't particularly like the dual name. I guess I would say that the Kanamaluka River Tamar is the gazetted name. So that's the name that we use, but this place has been known by other names in the past by other people. And so we've got the dual name to recognise that. We also know that um, First Tasmanians had different names for different lengths of the estuary. So while we call the whole thing Kanamaluka Tamar, we know that the upper estuary was known as Kanamaluka and downstream in the more marine waters was known as Pond Rabble. So we had a question from Ewan who says, North Esk and South Esk rivers are brown and that's okay? Question mark. I guess what I would say is that the brown in the South and North Esk rivers is caused by the tannins in the water. So you can still have clean water that's brown. You actually can't really tell a whole lot about the water quality just from the colour. We can have beautiful blue clear lakes and they're actually that colour because of mining tailings runoff. Or we can have red dams that are caused by um, acid mine drainage coming in from other places. So we can't tell much just by the colour of the water. We also know that in areas where we have storm water that discharges straight into our waterways rather than going through a treatment plant, that the water, the water colour in those creeks changes quite a bit. Um, and you could probably choose the colour of your waterway from some of these paint swatches because that's what happens to our waterways in these separated areas. The colour of the creek depends on what colour houses are being painted upstream and which brushes are being rinsed into the stormwater. We had a couple of comments, Joe and Lawrence amongst them, who raised the issue of sewerage entering the waterways untreated, and that's true. Launceston has a combined drainage system in the centre of the city, in the old part of town. It was built in the 1860s. It was state of the art at the time and it's the same sort of system that they have in Paris, in London, in New York. 700 cities in North America have combined drainage systems. They work really well um, for capturing the worst of the stormwater. So we know that stormwater is quite dirty. It carries all of the dirt and the oil, the rubbish, the cigarette butts, all of those things that are on our streets, they all end up in the stormwater network. In the combined system, when it rains a little bit, that, that water, the storm water that's got all those contaminants in it, that gets delivered out to the treatment plant and all those big items get screened out, the dirt gets screened out and then the water goes through the sewage treatment plant to get treated. When it's rained a lot and the system has been overwhelmed and it can't, the treatment plant can't take any more water, then we do start discharging water into the estuary. But it's a dilution factor, so we have a lot of cleaner stormwater because that first flush has been been washed, been taken away and cleaned, and there is some sewerage in there, but it's a low concentration relative to how much stormwater goes in. All of our pump stations have screening on them. The one exception is Old Margaret Street. It's our oldest sewage pump station in, this, in the city, and it's on track to be decommissioned as part of the River Health Action Plan. The River Health Action Plan is a $100 million investment that is part of the city deal and a large chunk of that money is going into the catchment work. So NRM North are leading that with fencing stock out of creeks, re-establishing riparian buffers. We know that if we can look after the river edges, then we stop a lot of sediment load getting in. We also know that if we can keep livestock out of the creek, we can stop them from their waste products from entering into the creek and that will have huge impacts, huge positive impacts on the water quality of those rivers that then come down into Launceston where we are. The other big chunk of the River Health Action Plan is works to improve the combined system catchment. So there have been huge improvements in water quality in, the, in Launceston. You can see from the chart where we had before Tea Tree Bend was installed, we had very high thermotolerant coliforms. So that is an indicator of faecal contamination. And we can see as different improvements have been made to the sewage treatment plant over time, over decades, those counts have come down and down and down it. And we're in the vanishingly small piece now. There are, there are gaps in the chart and that's because in over time we've changed the indicator species that we use, but we still do sometimes collect 
thermotolerant coliforms as well as enterococci so that we can compare the two and compare apples with apples and make sure that we are still on track to improving the water quality. The River Health Action Plan is going to see something like 70 to 80 per cent of the sewerage that currently spills into the North Esk in the Kanamaluka Tama that will disappear as part of the River Health Action Plan works. Uh, we had some comments about the location of the mudflats and, and the system. There are people who are talking about how they remember it being clean and empty and clear water. And that's true, it absolutely was. It was dredged and, and the mudflats were targeted as part of that dredging. So the mudflats were gone for quite a long time, but if we look at this early chart, this is drawn in the 1830s, 1833, and it really clearly shows a very similar layout to the system we've got now. We've got the big shoals on the western bank, we've got shoals of mud around here, which is what is now Royal Park and the Yacht Basin. This swamp up here, that's where we're standing right now. So in 1833 we would have been underwater very soon because the tide is coming up and we've reclaimed all of that land. So, but you can see these mud flats, they were all there then with a channel through the middle and that's pretty similar to what we've got now. Another question that a number of you raised, Ian in particular, talked about putting the dam in and, the, and what effect Trevallon Dam has had on the waterway and the location of the mudflats. There's a lot of factors that have changed the location and the nature of the mudflats since European settlement in Launceston. Um, we've lost a lot of our tidal prism, we've infilled a lot of wetlands, we've reclaimed a lot of land and we've changed the way that the, the salt water and the fresh water interact and that does change where the mudflats are and how big they are. We also know that we have more sediment running into the catchment than we did now that we have um, a lot of sediment running off our urban catchments, particularly from building sites and from the greater catchment in the agricultural sectors. There's been a lot of improvements to that, in the, uh, particularly in the catchment. So we've had the Forest Practices Code came in in 2000 and that had a lot of controls around streamside buffers and leaving vegetation on the streams to, to catch those sediments and we know, well, there's a lot of work in the agricultural sector to fence stock back from creeks and to reinstate those riparian buffers, those, that vegetation along the creeks. And that helps to keep that waterway clean. We can see from photos that predate Trevallon Dam that there were concerns then about the state of the Upper Yacht Basin in particular. There's a photo from 1950 taken by Burroughs um, on the day of the Henley on Tamer and it's highlighting the raw sewerage at Margaret Street and the mud flats that are exposed at low tide. That predated the dam by four years so we know that not everything that we see out here is a result of low flows coming through Trevallon Dam. One of the things that I'd really like people to understand is that everything that ends up in the, in the stormwater system ends up in a waterway somewhere at some point. It's all connected so in the combined system, it ends up in the, in the combined network and will go to the sewage treatment plant. But if you're not in the combined network, that stormwater network connects directly to the waterways. That's how it is everywhere. And so all of the cigarette butts, all of the oil, all of the dog poo that doesn't get picked up, all of the litter that gets dropped, all of that ends up in the, in the creeks. We have some systems in place in some of our waterways to try and catch that litter. We're starting to roll out some water sensitive urban design elements around the city to look after our, our waterways, that some of them are quite degraded. But it, it's also a personal responsibility that we're very careful about what we put down the stormwater network in order to prevent our creeks or our parks being polluted.